you could, uh, uh, those of you who are standing, take your seats. We are about ready to get started. So thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, the purpose of this event is to share with you key lessons from an achieved study that we are releasing today that's in the back of the room. Uh, in which we're examining in detail the college and career ready standards adopted by pioneering states, 16 states in the American Diploma Project Network. Uh, I am going to provide a brief overview of the study and its findings, uh, and uh, then we will uh, hear comments from, I think, a very, you'll agree with me, a very distinguished and important uh, uh, panel. I'm joined uh, uh, today by Governor Tim Pawlenty from uh, Minnesota, who is, uh, among other things, the Vice Chair of Achieves Board. He's also the Chair of the Education Commission of States on the Hunt Institute Board, just stepped down from the NGA Board. I think he runs everything. Uh, here. Uh, so uh, uh, he will make some comments. Uh, Governor uh, Phil Bredesen from Tennessee, who, uh, whose state is probably one of the most active members of the American Diploma Project Network. In fact, I believe it's the only state with its own state diploma project network. They've got a Tennessee diploma project, uh, and, and they have been doing some really outstanding work, and Governor, Governor Bredesen will offer some observations. And then a good friend and colleague of mine, Gene Wilhoyt, the executive Director of the Council of Chief State School Officers. So to start us off, let me first give you some uh, background for those of you who may not be uh, familiar uh, with it. The American Diploma Project Network was formed in 2005 uh, to help states align high school standards curriculum, assessment, and accountability with the knowledge and skills that young people need to have in order to succeed when they leave high school, whether it's in uh, post-secondary education or in uh, careers that pay well and that have real advancement potential. Uh, there are currently 33 states in the network. They educate 80% uh, of the public school students in the United States. Our focus today is on some of the states and some of the work they have done in particular. Uh, our report focuses on the standards, the academic standards in math and English language arts for the end of high school that 16 states uh, have adopted. 16 uh, have adopted math standards. 12 of the 16 have also adopted uh, English language arts standards. ACHIEVE provided assistance to each of the states in this study, though in different ways. In some cases, we provided very intense and, and sustained assistance. In other cases, uh, states requested less help from us, and we were happy to give the states what it is they thought they needed. Important, uh, importantly about the help that we provided, in every case, ACHIEVE was asked to do an external review of the state's standards before they were submitted for adoption to the appropriate governing boards. We served, among other things, as an external reviewer and validator of the uh, standards. In 12 of the states, because of the way we work with them, we also uh, did detailed reviews of the high school standards that they had in place at the time. Uh, I mention this because it shows that we had, in some states, a before measure and an after measure, and that will become clear in the importance of that will become clear in a moment. When we reviewed these standards, we compared them with the American Diploma Project benchmark expectations in math and English language arts. These benchmarks were the result of two years of research that Achieve did jointly with the Education Trust, the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation, and the National Alliance of Business, uh, and five states in an effort to identify the knowledge and skills that are essential for post-secondary uh, success. And among the things we found, importantly, is that uh, uh, there is a common set of knowledge and skills in math and English that young people need to have regardless of whether they are aiming for uh, college or whether they plan to go into the workplace. The 21st century jobs uh, increasingly require college level uh, preparation in order for young people to be well prepared for those. Now, when the states that are featured in this study did their own work and each of them adopted their own standards, uh, uh, that process uh, was, first of all, different from state to state, but it had some common elements. It was typically a joint effort of the K-12 system, the post-secondary education systems, in some cases it's more than one system, and employer 
workers or the workforce development system in each state. These separate entities and separate communities and systems came together. Secondly, they came together to try to anchor the standards, the expectations for young people in the real world demands that students will face. This was an evidence driven process, not just a consensus driven process. The idea was not to get to, to figure out what can everyone agree on, but rather what is the evidence suggest is essential for post-secondary success. Uh, in every state, in somewhat different ways, the teams of people that worked on this looked at national research. Uh, they looked at, at national models. They looked at evidence in the state of what were the most rapidly growing uh, occupations. Uh, they worked with employers to identify the skill set that was essential for those. They worked with faculty who taught uh, first year credit bearing courses in both two and four year institutions to identify the skill set that was essential uh, for success in those courses. And they found ways to put that together into a set of uh, jointly owned standards. In effect, what each of these states did was replicate the kind of research that we originally did for the American Diploma Project to identify these, these benchmarks. Our study focused on three basic questions. One is, how well aligned are the standards in each state to the definition of college and career readiness that emerged from our work? Put it somewhat differently, how rigorous are these standards? Secondly, in the states in which we could measure change over time, how did the rigor of state standards change from when these teams started with the high school standards they had in place till they wound up with uh, a new set of, of college and career ready standards? And thirdly, how common are the standards across the states? So let me briefly review those findings with you. Uh, first of all, looking across the 16 states in mathematics and the 12 states in, uh, uh, with English language arts standards. All of the state standards were well aligned with the ADP benchmarks or well aligned with only minor exceptions. In short, these are rigorous standards. If students meet those standards in every one of these states, they will be well prepared for what they plan to do after high school. That's very important. Secondly, where we could measure change over time, we saw some similar patterns in how state standards change from what typical high school standards were at the beginning to college and career ready standards at the end of the process. I'll just give you a few examples of that. In mathematics, most states added learning about proofs to their geometry standards. In most cases, they didn't have proofs there, yet that's critical for learning logical uh, reasoning uh, skills. Secondly, most states strengthen the attention they pay to data, probability, and statistics, a uh, set of knowledge and skills that employers in particular uh, 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 find increasingly important in the workplace. Uh, most states strengthen their focus on mathematical modeling and focus on the ability to translate real world problems into quantitative formulations that could then be solved. In English language arts, we also saw some typical patterns in the changes that states made. Uh, most states paid far greater attention to a variety of communications skills uh, by the end of the process than they had at the beginning. For example, uh, it turns out, particularly when you talk to employers in, in these states, the ability to participate, in produ participate productively in self-directed work teams, to work with others, to share information, to listen and understand what people are saying to you, to deal with differences in a productive manner, to contribute, etc. All of that turned out to be important, little of which was reflected in, in most high school standards when states started, much more clearly reflected uh, now. Similarly, a much greater emphasis in English standards in these states uh, in producing work-related texts, memos, correspondence, project plans, proposals, etc. Much more of that kind of writing uh, now than was reflected in the standards uh, before. Uh, 
much more emphasis on the ability to read informational text, not just read literature in, in high school standards, and the ability to synthesize information from multiple text and put it together into a, uh, a, a sort of a logical, coherent manner. And then finally, with respect to English, uh, there was much more balance at the end of the process between attention to literature, which is still important, and the attention to informational text. So those are some of the changes that we saw. And in all cases, right, the standards move from less rigorous to more rigorous, from less applied to more applied, from less attention to workplace demands to more attention to workplace demands. The final question that we addressed uh, is, is we look to see wh what level of commonality there is across the states. In order to do this, our, in our analysis, we focused on a subset of the American Diploma Project benchmarks, about a third of the ones we had produced in mathematics and in English language arts. We try to focus on the core that was most essential. And this core basically reflected two things. One is the most advanced skills that uh, college faculty and employers kept pointing out were lacking in the students and the graduates that they were seeing. And secondly, some of the foundational skills that students might have learned earlier in, in their schooling experience, in middle school, for example, but, but may not have gotten much attention uh, throughout the rest of their high school experience, and it showed by the time they got to the college classroom. So we had a core that we focused on, and what we found was a common core across the states. That is, there's a common core of expectations that are important to college faculty, are important to employers, that are now incorporated into the standards of each of these uh, states. Now, two things are important about this. One is the way that we got to a common core was by the individual decisions of individual states about what was important to them. Uh, the commonality is a byproduct of the effort, and it's a byproduct of the uh, focus on anchoring standards in real world demands. The real world is exercising discipline here in terms of what states determine is important for young people to learn. Second thing I want to pa point out is that a common core of expectations doesn't mean that the standards are identical from state to state. There still is variation across the states. They vary in some of the additional content that they include. Uh, in mathematics, for example, some states have more rigorous content for all students than are included in this uh, common core, though again, the common core is much more rigorous than what states had uh, before. Uh, in writing, for example, most states think it's really important for young people to be able to keep personal journals, to write that kind of personal uh, reflective essay. That's not something that college faculty or employers typically demand, but, uh, but states have it in their standards, and that's just, just fine. Uh, there's also differences among the states in how they organize their standards. Some states organize their standards into courses, English 1, English 2, Algebra 1, Geometry, etc. And those, dis those standards tend to be more comprehensive than in states that organize them by grade span. Here's what students ought to know uh, by the end of grades 9 and 10. Here's what they ought to know by the end of grades 11 and 12. Point again is that there are differences among the uh, states around this common core. Final point I will uh, make, and I know the rest of the panel will pick up on this in various ways, is I think what's most significant about this study is that it demonstrates the feasibility of a state-led effort to create a common core of expectations. As you know, most analyses of state standards show when you look at them in detail that they are literally all over the map, uh, that there's tremendous variation and little commonality from state to state. What the states that have done this work have demonstrated is that it is possible to get to a common core by states doing a really good job of developing standards that reflect world, re real world demands. And that is different than the discussions you typically hear about national standards. It's not what's happened here. This is a state-led effort. It's not led by the federal government. But they have gotten to a very consistent common endpoint. So with that, uh, that's a quick summary of what we did and what we learned. And I'd now like to call on Governor Palente for some comments. 
Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. As mentioned, I'm the vice chair of the Achieve Board and delighted to be here and be part of this important announcement. Michael did a great job providing an overview of the kind of origins of the report and the value that we hope it serves in providing uh, assistance and support to states, but also to the education debate uh, more broadly. A couple of uh, points by way of emphasis. Uh, as you know, the need for education reform and improvement is continuous and it's perhaps uh, more acute now uh, than ever before. Uh, just one generation ago, if you missed the educational rung, you could still, or skill rung, you could still in many instances enter the marketplace and find a job that might uh, pay good uh, wages and benefits uh, without a particularly robust skill set. Those jobs are mostly gone now. And so everybody uh, needs to, first of all, graduate from high school, and second of all, needs to have a post-secondary education or a post-secondary skill development opportunity that's relevant and applicable to the economy of today and the economy of tomorrow. And both educationally and in terms of our economic outlook, we're not there as a country and as respective states. We have a lot of work to do. We have a country of just uh, 300 million people. It sounds like a lot of folks, but compared to some other parts of the world, it's uh, a modest-sized country. But we're leaving about a third of our team on the bench. Uh, Time Magazine about a year and a half or two years ago documented that a third of our students nationally or so are not completing high school in time or dropping out. And if you drop out of high school, there's a substantial uh, probability that you're going to end up in the criminal justice system, going to end up in one or more of all the government programs, government housing, government transportation, government health care. Certainly not good for the individuals involved in, in many cases and certainly not good for our country as a whole. It's a, a moral and social and economic imperative that we improve the educational and skill uh, outlook and opportunities uh, for our citizens. It's a key to our quality of life and certainly a key to our future quality of life. And with that in mind, we turn to this uh, standards movement and Achieve's role in the standards movement. Achieve plays an incredibly important role. It's a very well-regarded nonpartisan organization that provides not just as a think tank of ideas, but it also really provides uh, consulting services with a value on rigor and validation to its clients or members, and namely states. And so in this case, you have a situation where states like Minnesota or Tennessee, where my good friend uh, Governor Bredesen is from, um, where go through the kind of regular or continuous process of updating, modernizing our standards. But if you don't have some ability to have a third party come in and validate whether those changes are actually rigorous and relevant to the economy and the needs of the post-secondary institutions and the employers and the private sector, you'll see some slippage. And an example of this amongst many would be we have the NAEP test, which uh, many would agree I think is a, a pretty good measurement, and see the divergence between those NAEP test results and the state concocted tests uh, that occur at the local and state level. And you'll see many states patting themselves on the back for these you know, alleged dramatic gains in reading or some other topic when in fact if you compare those uh, as a cross-reference to the NAEP scores, you'll see the progress is not nearly as dramatic or if it's happening at all even existent. And so the ability for a well-regarded nonpartisan uh, organization like Achieve to come in and, and validate or put the good housekeeping stamp of approval on these standards is incredibly important, not just in terms of the acceptance of the standards, but also the development of them. They provide a great resource in that regard. Minnesota, and I know many, many other states have benefited mightily from that. We're right now going through the process of updating our math standards. It's in rulemaking, and that has to be finally approved and it will be implemented. But this has achieved, uh, no pun intended, pretty good uh, ratings from the Achieve organization in the scorecard and soon to follow our uh, next generation English language art standards, which we hope will get uh, similar results uh, from Achieve. We have a absolute need to do this. Um, I, for one, think it's a better idea, better approach to have states uh, voluntarily agree to something like the America Diploma Project to say, all right, we're going to have common standards, common goals, common expectations, but we will develop them together. We will join in voluntarily, mutually challenge each other, provides a uh, kind of a, an approach that's consistent with states as the laboratories of democracy, a little smaller, a little quicker, a little easier to change if need be than, uh, say, a federal approach. And so I like this idea, personally, of an America Diploma Projects and states joining in 
in voluntarily to a common standard. But then we need to make sure the standards underneath that are rigorous and achieve as the validator uh, serves that role. We also, of course, know that there's been some debate about, well, you know, as people think about different career or educational trajectories, is there really a common core? That's been a question that's been asked, and some of you have even challenged that assumption. But this uh, process has led to this announcement today. All across the, the country, in these early adopter states, we've gone out to our post-secondary education institutions and to our private sector partners and said, you know, what precisely are the minimum skills? Uh, for either a post-secondary education or a post-secondary, you know, skill development opportunity. What are they? And there's been a great deal of work that went into it. And the conclusion, as this report reflects, is at least for the basic levels of competency, the core competencies, you start at the same place. And so this core knowledge or uh, core that Michael in the report talks about is important uh, to establish what that is, identify what that is, and then build on it. doesn't mean it's where you end, but it means that's the minimum that everybody, all children, all students uh, have to receive. And then lastly, um, where it goes from here is we've got 16 early adopter states and 33 uh, states in the American Diploma Project more broadly. We hope more will join in and believe that they will. These things take a little time. You can't just flip the switch on and off. Uh, if you're going to introduce new math standards, particularly in a place like Minnesota that says you got to have Algebra 1 to get out of eighth grade, and we've put that requirement in a couple years ago, Algebra 2 now to graduate from high school plus two other years of some type of math. Uh, we also increased our science standards, but the consequences are such that you, know, you, you won't move on, you won't progress, you won't graduate unless you pass or demonstrate competency in some of these fields. So having new standards and then getting the curriculum aligned to the standards and then making sure it all aligns to the test takes a little bit of work and Achieve has been very helpful in that whole process. So I think the report is going to be uh, an important uh, piece of the discussion as we go forward and the idea that everybody's going to get to a common core, identifying what the core is, making sure we have standards, not standards for standard stake, but standards connected to the actual identifiable, articulable needs of the higher education institutions and the workplace and other post-secondary opportunities, I think is incredibly important. And I applaud Achieve for its continued leadership and work, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Do I introduce Phil, or is he just going to I'll introduce sure, Phil. Yeah. Phil Bredesen is a, is a wonderful uh, person and a wonderful governor in a state that is reform-minded, and he's a friend and has been involved uh, heavily in Achieve, not only recently, but for many years. And he's extremely well regarded on both sides of the aisle by governors and policymakers across the country. Uh, he has pushed great change and reform and accountability in his uh, state, and I'm delighted to introduce him as our next speaker. Thank you for that excellent impromptu um, uh, introduction here. If you're available, I could use you perhaps around a few other uh, venues. Uh, um, good afternoon to you all, and certainly, Mike, thanks to you and Achieve for inviting me uh, here today, and it's an honor to be with you, and, and of course, with, with my friend Tim Pawlenty and, and Gene here, and I'm glad, grateful for this opportunity. Um, in talking about the common ground we've covered, uh, what Mike has asked me to do is share a little bit of Tennessee's story as we've gone through this process. We've had a breakthrough this year uh, driven by our participation in the Diploma Project uh, that resulted in a completely new set of standards uh, being approved by our state uh, education, Board of Education this past January. We've made a lot of progress in a short amount of time, really thanks to the efforts of a strong partnership between our education and business communities. And I want to emphasize the business participation in this as I go. As I go along. You know, I, um, I'm not an educator. Uh, my training is in science. And um, all of us who are in public office, I think, talk about education a lot. Uh, a lot of people I've talked with, there's usually some experience in their own life or something in their uh, personal relationships that drives these things home. And I have to tell you, in my case, it was uh, it's this. I grew up in a very small town, actually, in upstate New York, and lived with my grandmother, who had 11 children. Um, 
And um, of those 11 children, one of them <coughs> had a college education. He got it in the military. The other 10 had a high school education, or in some cases less. My grandmother had a fourth grade education. And every one of them had what I would call mainstream, successful American lives. Every one of them owned their own home. A couple of them owned their own farm. Uh, they had some of the good things in life, cottages up on the lake and those kinds of things. Um, because you could come back from World War II and get a job that you were willing to work hard at in a factory, um, and you could be part of the mainstream in America. I look now with all of those uh, aunts and uncles, you can imagine the number of cousins I have and, uh, and uh, children of cousins and the like that are out there. You look at that and it's so clear today how untrue that is, that is today. The ones who went on to college are doing fine. The ones who followed in their parents' footsteps steps and figured they were going to get out of high school maybe and get a job in a local factory, you are no longer in the mainstream of economic life in this country. And it's just become very important to me as, as a steward uh, of our state to try to convince people through things like we're doing with the Diploma Project of the importance of a rigorous and solid education um, to, uh, to really participating in the good things that life in this country has got to offer. I've tried to make education the number one priority in our state. Um, and the approach has been to identify a few key areas and just really focus on them. I used to be a business CEO, and I think what CEOs do is, you know, find those two or three things that if you get them right, things work. Um, and in the case of education, I think absolutely standards is one of those things. If you got good standards, if you measure them well, I think if you concentrate on teacher quality, you'll have a good education system and give the kids this, the kinds of things that they uh, they need. Um, also believe in taking these things a step at a time. You know, when you go to cross a, uh, a, a river, you don't just take a fling at the opposite bank. You try to find some stepping stones and work your way across. And this progress we have in standards has been part of our way of finding some good ways to, uh, to bridge this. Um, the thinking is straightforward. Before you can hold somebody accountable, you have to be clear with them what's expected. I mean, any business executive knows one of your big jobs is you have to tell people who work for you with clarity what it is you, um, you expect of them. And uh, we discovered in Tennessee, I think, a serious issue with uh, lack of truth in advertising about how well we were doing in our school systems. It was actually brought to my attention by a 2007 report from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, that basically said we were one of those states that were telling our kids they were doing well when they really they really weren't. I'll give you an example. Um, our eighth grade students, and Tim referred to, referred to this um, in his uh, presentation, uh, our eighth grade students all take Tennessee tests in math, and when they take those tests, we tell 87 percent of them that they are proficient in math. When they take the national standards exam, 21 percent of them are graded, uh, are graded proficient. Now, I can explain away 10 percentage points difference in there. I can't explain Explain away 60 or 70, and um, and um, and one of the things that I've found just in putting the political coalitions together is while there are lots of differences of opinion across political and ideological lines about how to improve schools, I think one thing people can agree on is the need to be completely honest about where we are, honest with students and honest with parents and honest with ourselves about where we are, and I really feel that we're starting now to be able to do that in Tennessee. Uh, the other driving force uh, in the standards effort was a matter of public confidence. In 2007, I uh, <clears throat> did the unthinkable and asked for new taxes and got them uh, for education. Um, part of the process of restructuring how those dollars were spent uh, is we saw it as a two-way street. Uh, we saw it as a contract with the schools. We give them some of the money they they needed and wanted, uh, and uh, but they would have some new ways of being accountable for those those results. To create new standards, we rolled up our sleeves and really went to work with the Diploma Project as the blueprint. Um just as we're discussing today that nationwide, I think we're seeing some of the very best efforts in creating new standards come from the grounds up. They're coming from the states themselves rather than being cast down by some bureaucracy somewhere within the sound of my uh, my voice here. Um, and, uh, and I really think that that's a very solid way of uh, producing these standards. I'm a believer that ultimately there has to be some overlay um, where you make some commonality in the states, but these things have to arise out 
out of the real experiences, I think, of real school systems and teachers and, and superintendents and not people who are locked up somewhere in a conference room in our Tennessee state, state capital. So we got out and talked to people on the ground, primarily the business community and higher education, <clears throat> who are the ones who really see the results of our school systems. Um, as I said, I've got a background in business, and certainly one of the things I learned is it helps to once in a while to actually talk to a real customer and find what they think uh, what they think about your your uh, your product. Uh, so actually, it was last summer we traveled around the state. Uh, we did I did about 1,800 miles in Tennessee. Uh, we talked to I uh, wrote the numbers down: 135 business leaders representing 114 companies, over 500 faculty members uh, of a number of the various college and universities, and we heard some things from them that were pretty surprising. Some you kind of expected, and some that were new. Um, we had an executive, I remember, from a staffing services company um, that told us that he had to screen 100,000 people to find 11,000 who met their basic qualifications. Some didn't make it because they didn't have a diploma or pass a drug test, but those who got through, um, uh, who were high school graduates, only 60% of them could pass the basic math test. Um, and that was troubling enough, but then I asked him for a copy of the test, which he happened to have with him. Uh, this basic math test that these select the ones that had been selected could not pass uh, was stunning. It was a 20 question t test and the question number 20, the hardest one, was something of the general caliber of add you know one sixth and one half um, or some such um, some such kind of number. It is unconscionable that we would turn out anyone out into the world, anyone out into the world who could not pass the test that he uh, that he that he handed me. Another executive told us that uh, she had to put a new policy in place forbidding people to take the application home to complete because they were having family members fill them out and they'd show up the first day of uh, first day of work they wouldn't have the basic grammar skills that had been demonstrated. Um, if this had been a I don't know a company that had a lot of uh, uh, unskilled labor a landscaping company I wouldn't have been surprised. This happened to be the Federal Reserve Bank that told this particular uh, particular story. Um, and and uh, there, there were some things we learned from these that were expected. Kids don't know math, which I just described to you. Others that were less, expen uh, less expected to me. Um, one of the big things business looks for is group problem solving skills because in these flatter organizations, uh, there's much more premium now on people getting together and solve problems. And we've altered some of our standards to make sure that some of these things that businesses are looking for are, are included. Um, we uh, we took all this stuff and working um, wor this information and working with uh, uh, with the diploma project wrote a new set of K through 12 standards. Uh, they were adopted by our state board in January. Uh, the new set of graduation requirements go into effect for the class of 2013. Obviously, it starts much earlier. Tracking up through um, and looking ahead, our next task here is to make sure that we uh, assess our students in a realistic and appropriate way, and uh, really to focus as it now on on teachers. Uh, all of this work will be in vain if we don't also make sure that we're getting the very best teachers in the classroom and retaining them and um, and uh, it's ultimately they they who will translate these new standards in, into action. Um, we've made a lot of progress and as I said earlier I think that the key to the success has been the partnerships the business community in higher education K-12 and, and state government achieve we all join forces. Um, I believe that these lasting partnerships we all and, politics talk about partnerships. I think they're particularly important when it comes to education reform and standards in particular um, because when it comes to real change in anything as big and complex as education, we can't get sidetracked by the idea de jour or the idea de month or the idea de administration or anything else. We need to have lasting solutions that become embedded in the communities that groups who transcend individual administrations uh, have bought into. To. Um, and uh, you know we'll keep in place long after a governor is gone or a secretary of education is is gone. Um, I learned that I used to be mayor of Nashville before I was governor. I learned that um, during my time there, one of my great failures uh, as mayor was I spent a huge amount of time and political capital um, uh, putting in place a thing called the core curriculum in the Nashville schools. This is the E.D. Hirsch effort, and it was kind of my first uh, uh, pass with standards. I got it in place. 
Um, and when I left office, I'd say it lasted probably almost six months uh, before it had, it had uh, subsequently gotten, uh, you know, a new school director comes in and teach, some teachers don't like it and just sort of it all disappears. So I've one of the things I promised myself as governor, if you're going to make these changes, make them slower and make them so they're not Phil Bredesen's policy or Phil Bredesen's program, but something that is owned by the business community, it's owned by the higher education community, and it'll have the kind of legs that it takes to uh, uh, to stay going uh, for a long time. And that's why the business community to me has been such an important partner, not only as a customer, but as a repository for the, uh, I guess, the will to carry these things, uh, these things through. And in partnership with a sustained voice like Achieve, um, I think we can, pr to provide that third party va uh, validation, I think we really have something that can uh, persist and go on. So that's the thought I'd like to leave you with today, um, and that is that uh, we can only see real, real progress if we find a way to make these changes last. These are big systems, these changes take time, um, and it's one of the things that I have you know, very high hopes that Achieve can be a partner, not only for us, but for a lot of states across the country as we all struggle uh, with the issue of how to really do right by the young people who are who are in our state and get them prepared not only to be good uh, uh, good workers but also good citizens of this wonderful country of ours we've got some momentum now in Tennessee we got great partners we intend to keep them there thank you for inviting me here today thank you very much good afternoon my uh, comments could be summarized under a question, I think, uh, how real is this effort? I want to start by thanking Mike and the team Achieve for the work they've done. Uh, this is an important first in the country. Um, it's ground laying uh, uh, in two ways. First of all, uh, for the first time, uh, states are now setting standards against a benchmark, against an external measure. Uh, it, that measure is agreed upon. We must get all of our students ready for the world they will face. That means being able to succeed once they enter higher education or enter into a rewarding and competitive life work. That's the first difference. The second is that uh, we're doing it together uh, for the first time in our history. Uh, it is possible to work together and to set high goals. That's what's happening in this initiative. We worked uh, long and hard in the states to uh, incorporate the ideas around standards-based reform. Uh, and we, in those early stages, did listen to some national groups and organizations about what they perceived to be important elements to put into those standards. But by and large, we did this independently. Uh, we did not take advantage of the work of the other states. So what ACHIEVE has done in this process is to bring us together, first of all, around a common standard or common expectation, and in that process, bring us together for the greater good. Um, Chiefs feel strongly that uh, a state-led effort, especially given the proof that is coming forward in this work, is the best way to go in this country. Uh, contrary to uh, wisdom of a few years ago, uh, when many people thought this was not possible, we do feel that this is the fast and, and fastest and most efficient way uh, for standards development in this country. Uh, we, we know right now from the momentum that this is a positive step forward. So there's leadership around a common set of standards it's coming from the states, and there are committed and engaged people in, in these states pushing this endeavor. Committed, engaged governors, chief state school officers, commissioners of higher education, the corporate community, and educators. That kind of a partnership uh, is bringing about substantive change. And the important part is they're facing some very difficult issues because they all know that once these standards are raised, it's going to be much more difficult work in the next few years. But they also know that there is an important cause here that must be met in the country. Not all of our children are graduating, and not all of the children who do graduate are reaching the kinds of potential that we, they need to reach. That can no longer be tolerated. 
The other point I would make is the states realize that this is a beginning point. Uh, when we come together around these standards, there's a lot more work to be done uh, in standards, but there's more work that will come out of this work. This is ground laying. Because when you reset your standards at a higher level, uh, when you make those standards competitive, uh, then you have to step back and reflect on some very important questions. What kind of assessments do we have in place in the states? Do those assessments truly reflect these higher standards? And are we asking students out of those assessments to truly exhibit what they know and are able to do? Or do we need to continue to think about new assessments and new designs? What kind of data systems are going to be necessary to support these higher standards? What kind of linkages are going to have to be established between higher education and K-12 education and the corporate community as we try follow those students through their life careers? Are these changes and expectations truly leading to the kinds of jobs and the kinds of educational success that we predict? What does this mean for educators in the classroom, for those principals and superintendents in buildings, and for those teachers who are delivering education? We're going to be asking and are asking of them much more than we have in the past, because these standards, as Mike said, are not only an assurance that we're reaching those basic competencies, but we're raising expectations to meet the skills that these students are going to need to be successful in this global society. What about the students themselves? What kinds of learning opportunities are going to have to be developed that would support this kind of learning? So on one level, this kind of a change in expectations in assessments and in standards, teacher design and student supports are going to have to walk along simultaneously and support each other. On the other hand, we know this is a beginning in terms of standard setting. Uh, these 16 states have come forward. We applaud their effort. 33 states are engaged in the process. Uh, we know now as we learn more from the states, we will be able to revise and upgrade and clarify these standards. We know that as states move forward, we're going to try to uh, keep all of this work in the context. And uh, I know right now, uh, after all the states, the chiefs look at this report today, they're going to be looking at what Tennessee and Georgia are doing because they are very closely aligned with these standards and they'll be doing the same thing. So as the states move forward, this will all change and improve. So we look forward to that kind of change. Now some people have asked about this as opposed to a federal effort. And just let me say that we think by far this is a, a superior way uh, to set standards. We do believe that uh, there is an important role for the federal government in supporting this kind of effort. Certainly, there shouldn't be any sort of cross purposes in federal policy and state policy. There ought to be complicating policy set and directions. Uh, the governors, the chief state school officers, and others are trying to figure out what this proper role for the federal government is. It may be in the form of incentives to ensure that more states are on this exciting path. It might be that we need additional flexibility in current federal law. It may mean we need to implement new designs and new systems. There are additional kinds of issues that will come forward as we talk. I could say to you today that we are all committed to this conversation and figuring it out with our partners at NGA and Achieve to develop a much stronger Common Core and a federal support system around them. This week, a couple of days ago, Mike and I met with the uh, chiefs and uh, we discussed the uh, progression that, that is uh, going forward in these 16 states. Uh, Mike highlighted uh, that work for the uh, other states. Uh, we encourage those other states among the 33 who are in the process to make sure that they don't lose momentum and they keep progress and we solicit the participation from all of the other states to engage in this process. As you can see, the council's committed to this development and uh, states are voluntarily nesting uh, their this common core in their state standards. Uh, we are well on the way uh, to seeing higher, clearer, fewer standards established in all the states anchored in a common core across them. Uh, I think I've answered my question. This is real. Thank you.
Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Governor Bredesen, and thank you, Governor Palente. I think we've put a few issues on the table. Uh, some of you might have some questions or reactions, and we are delighted to entertain them. Uh, if you've got questions, please just raise your hand, and I'll, I'll try to recognize as many people as I can in the time uh, that we've got. I would ask, uh, it's hard to tell standing up here uh, 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 who's a journalist and who's not, but I would ask that if there are reporters who have questions, uh, they go first, and then we, we open it up to others. Anyone is permitted to raise their hand if they have a question. <laughs> yes, and could you please identify yourself when you speak? There's a microphone coming. There you go, it's ready. Thank you. Uh, my name is Penny Engel, and I'm with the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. But my question has to do with the level of the standards. I think Governor Pawlenty referred to them as basic, minimum, and then I often hear oh, world-class standards. Um, I, uh, I would like to get some clarification on what level these standards are developed. There may be less difference between basic and world-class than you think. These are basic in the sense that they provide a floor, a foundation below which uh, no student ought to, ought to go when they uh, uh, graduate from high school. Uh, but they are much more rigorous, much more advanced than uh, the current expectations uh, for uh, uh, high school graduation. Uh, in, in, in at least if you looked as about two or three years ago when we started this work, there were no states that set expectations for completing high school that were close to the level of sophistication, the level of knowledge, the kinds of skills that are needed in order to succeed afterwards. So these are more rigorous than they were before, uh, but they are basic in the sense that this is what you need to know to be prepared for what comes after high school. I would just also, say, go ahead. Okay, I'm just going to also add with my intent with those comments was that this core is what everybody needs. There's clearly going to be some students who desire or are able to do even more beyond this, and we don't want to say that this is the, you know, the end or the final. It's just it's a place where everybody at least needs to get to, and then some students will be able to go beyond. I would just say that. Um, uh, in terms of def defining this, there is um, uh, a real effort to define the essentials of success in terms of content, but within that content base, uh, I think if you look at these expectations, you'll see that there are, are a higher level of cognitive challenges being requested of students than there were before. Uh, the um, report addresses issues around critical thinking and problem solving, around making uh, judgments from current data into new contexts and circumstances. It addresses an expansion of what have people have defined in the past in certain areas like communication. It's oral communication as well as written. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, this is not basic in the sense of our prior definition of basic. And, and I, I might just add as well that I, I look at this as, as, as a governor as um, the standards themselves are one aspect of it. It's one thing we get out of it. To me, the more important issue is putting in place a process by which you're willing to, first of all, put the standards on a table and shine a light on them and, uh, and get input from people as to what's working and what's not. I'm sure the standards we adopted last January um, are not perfect. I'm sure they'll be even less perfect five and ten years from now. And my hope in this is not to have established the ultimate standard and what high school students should know, but to have put in place a process by which they're constantly reviewed and, and, um, and, and, and updated and made more and more relevant. Thank you. Other questions? Why don't we just work our way back on the right? First of all, are there reporters who have questions? I want to make sure. Okay, then let's go over to the right there. I think I'm going to go back where I can. Hi, uh, Jim Hall from the Center for Public Education. I was just wondering uh, what ADP, uh, ADP states have been doing to connect their K-8 standards to high school standards so they're aligned. Very good question. Uh, that varies from state to state. Uh, some states, Tennessee being an example, basically took on the K-12 standards all at once and that depends in part on the timing for states. Uh, but when their assessment contracts uh, have to be renewed when they've last done the 
uh, 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 you know, K to, K to 8 uh, standards. Other states have just focused right now on the end of high school standards, want to get that anchor in place, and then we'll turn, uh, uh, depending on the timing in their state, we'll turn to the rest of the standards. Nobody thinks that uh, simply doing end of high school and calling it a day is, is, is the right approach, though. Hi, Elizabeth Schneider with the Alliance for Excellent Education. Just want to congratulate you all on this uh, report and announcement and the states for their work in this area. And especially leaders um, who, as Governor Bredesen described, have really tried to approach this in a way that it will be owned um, by multiple parties and will stay in place. Um, I guess my question is we've um, listened to a lot of criticisms around state standards for years and I'm thinking of Bill Schmidt talking about mass standards and how there are just too many and they're not focused enough. And, you know, the mantra that we've heard is fewer, clearer, higher. And I'm wondering how that reconciles with a common core that represents only a third of a state's standards, how, how this continues to give guidance that leads to appropriate instruction and focus. Good, good question. Let me clarify. Um, when we did the original research in the American Diploma Project, we came up with a set of benchmark expectations. There are roughly 90 or so that we identified in mathematics and about 60, I forget the exact numbers, in um, uh, English language arts. That reflects what we think is essential for young people to know at the end of high school. When we looked to see if there was a common core across the states, we selected a subset of those, about a third of the ones we had identified. And we did that because we wanted to make sure that we focused on the most essential things. And if you, if, if students, if the standards that we identified are those that, again, employers and post-secondary faculty were most clearly saying were not, uh, were not what students had when they left high school. The <coughs> other benchmarks that we identified are typically things you need to learn on the way to getting these. So that's where that third is. It's the ones that we think are most essential, but the others are supporting, if you will. When we've reviewed state standards, in addition to commenting on their rigor and how well they align with the ADP benchmarks, we typically comment, in fact, always comment on their clarity, their specificity, their manageability, their focus, their measurability, right? The characteristics of good standards. And so, and it is the case from the work we, we've done with these states that there still is room for improvement on many of those dimensions and we still need to help states have a more focused set of standards so that it's possible to teach them effectively and in some depth and Bill Schmidt's analysis is I think right on the money on that. Gene, did you want to yeah, comment on I, that? I think this fewer is the issue that's in front of us um, and and uh, I think this effort will help in, in, that, in that way. One, I think as we go through the different uh, reflections around what is common now uh, there will be more commonality uh, as the states move forward. Uh, but secondly, we are we have a major conversation going within the states about the fewer issue. Uh, we know now that in many states, they're putting forward an unteachable agenda. And that is too many standards to act, literally uh, cover with proficiency in the time allotted in a school year. Uh, so we are uh, in a serious conversation about how we reduce that. Last thing I'd say is, Thanks to you and your colleagues at the Alliance for being a, a major voice uh, toward this effort. Um, it's been a, uh, a, a wonderful message to hear and, and something very important uh, for this movement. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Ames with the National Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, I was struck by Jean Milhoyt's comment about how as standards in states uh, increase uh, with rigor, that there are going to be uh, needed additional student supports. And I think that's probably true, but that gets me to thinking about funding. A lot of states are, fund are facing uh, budget constraints, especially these days, and projected to continue into the future uh, if states are going to continue increasing the rigor uh, of the standards, how are we going to find the funding to, uh, to pay for these, these increases? 
I will take a shot at that, but I suspect there'll be others who want to come in on that as as well. Um, uh, several things. One is I think we're going to have to find ways to help individual states and groups of states make more efficient use of the resources that they're spending now. Just one example of how common standards can help on that. As many of you may know, there are 14 states that we're working with that are participating in a common end of course exam in Algebra 2. One of the things that's significant about that is that the development and implementation costs for the testing are cheaper as a result of the states working together. They share the, the costs of development uh, and, and, and in, in fact the way our the contract is structured with the test development uh, company, the cost per student goes down as the number of students taking the test goes up. So more states, more students, lower per student. Uh, cost. And I mentioned that just in a, as one example of how states working together anchored in a common core of standards can actually create needed tools uh, at a, I think a higher quality and a lower cost than is the case if they work on their own. Anyone the else? Governors want to know this much more directly than I, but uh, you're correct. State budgets are tight and, and, and they're going to be tight for a while. And uh, that leads us to this set of efficiency, but I think. Uh, uh, the point that was made earlier about um, this should be a long-term and sustained effort that uh, goes beyond any sort of economic cycle and, and uh, they come and go but uh, in the short term I think we will have intense pressures on finding efficiencies in the system. I would just give another example from within the education budget. Uh, if you aggregate the amount of resources right now that are being expended by the federal government, by state governments and by local uh, edge districts around something we call professional development. Uh, that could be aggregated into a dynamic set of supports for teachers, uh, capturing a tremendous amount of uh, money that is now being expended in many cases uh, into efforts that are not as effective and not as supported by teachers as they should be. Engaging teachers and what's important to them at a school site level uh, around these important initiatives is going to be much more productive. Yes, thank you. Tony Cortese from the American Federation of Teachers. I just want to applaud the states that were involved in this and achieve for showing that it can be done if we collaborate and uh, um, we can work toward not having such a hodgepodge of 50 standards across 50 states. And so I think this is an important development. Um, my question has to do with like next steps and Jean was just mentioning one about professional development. Um, probably all of us remember that when we did standards the first time uh, we never bothered to do the steps in the middle uh, which uh, were curriculum development, instructional materials and professional development. So um, what, what role will achieve play, if any, in getting the states to cooperate on those other steps in between and avoid doing what we know is a mistake and, and moving directly into assessments before we've laid all the groundwork to do that. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, one of the reasons we have partners like the Council of Chief State School Officers is, uh, and, and we talk constantly with the National Governors Association as well, is to figure out the answers to those uh, questions. Achieve doesn't have the capacity to take on all of that, but you're absolutely right that all those things need to get done, that if we simply raise the bar uh, and measure it, and we need to do both of those things, if we're not providing the supports that are necessary, uh, then, then we won't get the job done. Uh, so there's a conversation in CCSSO about how best to do that. I think you heard both from Governor uh, Plenty and Governor Bredesen about some in-state efforts that are underway, particularly on teacher quality issues. So uh, uh, we're at the early stages of this and I think there's a lot to be figured out but this provides a kind of foundation for that. Governor? Well, it's good to see you again, Tony. Thank you for being here. Um, one aspect of this, and this is just one slice of a much broader discussion about <coughs> excuse me, teacher training and staff development is even in a place like Minnesota, if you have a state standard, we have you know hundreds of school districts most of whom have a curriculum director who go about the business of trying to develop and design their own curriculum, sometimes more than one person. And then, of course, you have national textbook companies who 
want to make sure they capture as much of the market share as possible, but the textbook is geared to California, Texas, Florida, New York, understandably because they're larger markets, but they want to make sure they cover the waterfront broad enough to include the Minnesota standards, but you know, there's a bunch of slop over back and forth between what's going on in California and what's going on in Minnesota, and then you've got a bunch of people trying to figure out, should we buy this textbook or that textbook? And sometimes they're well equipped to do it, sometimes they aren't. And then the corollary in staff development is, even though we have the same state standard, the staff development practices are wildly inconsistent, very wildly in quality, and the whole thing is a jumbled, inefficient, not very well managed set of events. So again, this is only one slice of a much broader discussion on staff development, but if you could get common standards in 30 states, uh, I think you could get some enormous economies of scale and some enormous quality improvements by consolidating and raising the rigor and the expectations and the, f the funding around staff development, textbook publishing and purchasing, curriculum development, and related activities. And right now, let's face it, you know, you know as well as I do, it's a, it's a hodgepodge, and some of it's good, some of it isn't. Yeah. And our, our experience with, uh, with Achieve has been that they've been very good about, I think, explaining to everybody that, that standards are, the, are, are one thing, but you know, they're like an army. You can say you want to go invade here, but somebody's got to make sure the boots get there, and the gas gets there, and all the mechanics it takes to actually go out and implement those. And again, that's something I think they've done, done very well. I, I'd also mention, it didn't get mentioned in any of the, the talks, one of the things that from a state that has a number of disadvantaged students in it, um, one of the things that I think is wonderful about a further development of standards um, and, and the curriculum and the detail that goes with that is in poorer districts, uh, in inner city districts, some of these rural districts, we have an enormous issue with children moving multiple times during the course of the school year. I mean, these are very mobile people. And unless you've got things lined out so they're not just moving into some total new thing, they just lose those years all the time because the teacher can't, can't deal, they don't have the precursors uh, or they have some, they're just working on something else. So I think when you start talking about how you bring up that one third that Tim was talking about and how you, how you make that work, I think one of the real things that this can do is to put some more uniformity in the system so when children do move around they have a fair shot at, uh, at doing well. Just one other supplement, you know that big Algebra 1 textbook I'm told in you know, my daughter's uh, class, I can't remember exactly, but it was you know five to eight hundred pages long and I'm told that in many leading countries their Algebra 1 textbook is more like 200 pages long and so we have this propensity to try to cover the waterfront in part. It's a marketing issue because no textbook company or you know service wants to be leave out a state or some chunk of their standard or curriculum. And do we really, by the time my kids race through math, by the end of the year they couldn't tell you what they learned in September, much less what they learned you know two years ago. So rather than racing through 800 pages to get some commonality around these things and you know really learn two or 300 pages, it seems like it has some opportunities for improvement. We are uh, close to out of time. There were a couple of other <coughs> hands. We have more questions in time, but I know there were a couple of hands over here I want to make sure we get a chance uh, to, to, to call on before we have to close this. And then uh, some of us will be around for questions afterwards as well, but I know the governors probably have planes to catch, so I want to keep us on time. And over there, one over there, yeah. I'm Kathleen Manzo from Education Week. Um, I wonder if there are any plans to expand this into other subject areas, science, history, et cetera? At the, at the moment, we are heavily focused on mathematics and English. Um, uh, Achieve has plans to uh, develop science benchmarks uh, in the near future, and we're looking at science standards in other countries now as a way to, uh, to start that out. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't know what the appetite will be for common science. Uh, standards, but uh, but I'm sure we'll find out. Gene, did you have any? Yeah, I, I think general consensus is that that science is an important subject for us to to work on. Again, we're we're just in the talking stages. It's important that we get these two content uh, areas right and in place in the states, and that's where we're going to spend our short-term energies. Peggy, one last question. <clears throat> Hi, Peggy Siegel. Uh, this is a, a generational question. It has to do with the um, emerging generation coming up, commonly referred to as digital natives. And I'm just wondering, as you're thinking of standards, as, as the governors have said, this never ends, but 
as kids are coming up with new kinds of skills, one, are you seeing those kinds of challenges with Achieve and expanding on standards? And if so, how is that playing out? I think I'm going to yeah, talk to I, several. Just, just very quickly, uh, you, if you go th as you go through the uh, descriptors, you'll see that many of the expectations are related to uses of modern technology as well as communication skills and interactions with uh, the modern world, uh, the media, understanding messages and, and so forth. I would also say that's one of the areas uh, where there's least alignment right now. So there's a lot of work on our part at the state level to make sure that we, we put those into a, a common uh, set of standards across the states. Other comments? I would just say, uh, in addition to the skill set needed to use and deploy the technology, I think there's a whole other discussion around how technology is going to disrupt and change education by itself in the next 20 years. And I don't think our higher education systems in particular, much less our K-12 systems, have begun to even uh, understand that, much less envision it and come to terms with it. I, I think you look at this generation that's behind me, what? Or right behind Phil. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, uh, I mean, let's face it, they interact, they communicate, they socialize, they absorb and disseminate information fundamentally different than the generation that two or two that's in front of them. And the idea that they're going to be taught and learn in the mode that we're in right now, uh, I think is going to crumble. And the question is, are we going to envision it and get ahead of it, or are we going to allow them to do it for themselves or their kids when they get there? But when you see things like, you know, the University of North Carolina offering 90 nine zero degree programs online, and Phil and I had this discussion earlier, it doesn't replace teaching, it doesn't replace the traditional classroom for all the obvious reasons, but it's a powerful, powerful supplement that will, I think, fundamentally change this entire discussion within 20 years. Thank you. Well, to bring this discussion to a close, I would just hope that you walk away from here with two thoughts in mind. Uh, one is, as Gene said, this is a beginning, but there is real momentum uh, behind this, and every reason to think that the number of states that adopt some common core of standards will grow over time and that the standards will evolve over time as a result of that. Secondly, particularly as, as I listened to Governor Pawlenty and Governor Bredesen, it was a reminder of how many different ways these standards that are adopted are connected to other policies and other tools in the state. These are not standalone documents, right, whose value is their commonality. These are actually tools being put to use to affect curriculum, assessment, graduation requirements, college placement policies, and a whole bunch of other things. And that's why, among the reasons why the ownership that both governors and Jean talked about is so critical because these tools have to be put to use in a variety of different settings, at a variety of different levels, in a variety of different institutions. And that's what's made the work that these states have done uh, as hard as it's been and, and, and as deliberate as it's been so important and so likely to have a lasting uh, impact. So I hope you'll keep that in mind as you, you reflect on this conversation and I ask you to please uh, join me in thanking the panelists for a great discussion and their great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.